Great. How's this doing? Everybody here? Welcome. Thank you all for coming. It's a great honor and privilege. I was here, I think, two years ago. Don't uh, knock me down if that was last year. I have a busy life. And for those of you that haven't heard me speak, welcome for the first time. Um, if you're on social media, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, that's my home away from home, every five minutes uh, posting something. So uh, usually serious health information. Try very hard to represent uh, the person that can distinguish nonsense, like you will die if you eat beans, from real authentic science information. And somebody asked me about that, or Dr. Gundry of the Plant Paradox towards the end. Um, I will say the only thing I don't have in my biography, just to plug the sponsors, of which I have no connection at all, is I am on the cover of the Try Best Winter Catalog, um, and because uh, I am a fan of putting fruits and vegetables into blenders and drinking them down. It's a lot better than all the other choices we have out there. So I have been practicing cardiology for about 30 years. I've actually been a plant-based human for about 42 years. I so despised the food at the University of Michigan cafeteria. I converted in about a day before I knew anything about any of this stuff. I've also had the pleasure of having a son that spent 10 weeks at Hippocrates getting a health certifi certificate. He's uh, now an attorney, but still leads a very healthy life. And Brian and Anna were a great uh, health influence on him. So it's very good to see them here. So we're going to dive into talking about the worst of times to start with, and then the best of times. I love speaking about heart disease. Not everything I'm talking about is food. I have to bring in some technology, because I really, some of the notes or things you remember today, I want you directly to do something about on Monday in terms of your own health. I'll tell you about that in a minute. If you should ever wander through Detroit or Austin, Texas, we are in the restaurant business. Yes, that means I need psychotherapy. It is as hard as you think, but we are so passionate as a family about providing options for elegant and healthy dining. I decided who needs a 401k? I'll just open restaurants and uh, pretty much been an even exchange. It's a nice little drink. It's got all kinds of stuff to fire you up. Um, why the worst of times? Because you're all spending a whole lot of money if you have health insurance and you're not getting what you want out of it, which is health. Uh, and that's because we aren't teaching the public about what you're learning at this conference, about the critical importance of a lifestyle. Prescription drug surgeries, other therapies have a role at times, but if you're not extremely careful about your food, your sleep, your radiation exposure, your fitness, your weight, your stress, your happiness, your joy, your love, basically every book that Brian and Anne Marie have written on, uh, on the topic, you're, in, you know, you're not really fully utilizing the wonderful medical system we have in this country when you don't need it. Best to drive by hospitals, not drive in. So you can see this graph, and just to explain it, you see the line that's the lowest line, that's the United States. This is up to date 2017. We spend $10,833 a year per citizen on health care, and we get the lowest lifespan of all the countries shown here, where there are many countries that spend far less money on healthcare per capita, and they get more out of it. They get a longer life, and in some cases, they get a longer what's called health span. It shouldn't be this way. Uh, if we're going to spend all these dollars, that uh, you know, you know, you have the high deductibles and you have the premiums, and you know how expensive and how much it goes up every year. And, uh, you know, I can't solve that. We have a very, very challenging medical system. But I can tell you that your health care costs and your health span, a term I'll define in a minute, and maybe your lifespan are going to be at their best if you really, you know, take everything you learn at this conference and from the speakers and try to apply as much as possible. So I eat plants. I don't eat donuts. I don't eat bacon. I Exercise this morning before I rush to the airport to sit on the plane for two hours because they closed the Guardia. But, you know, you got to do what you got to do. I did put a premium on sleep, but got a little fitness in. So this is a rather sobering little diagram that the average lifespan in the United States is 79 years, a little more for women, a little less for men. And I almost am inclined. Ooh, it does work. I wanted to show on this, if you look at the end of the curve of the United States, 
What do you see happening the last three years? It's going down, and that's our dollars didn't go down. Lifespan actually has gone down. Very remote, small amounts, but it's going down. It's the first time ever. Some people are blaming the opioid crisis and overdoses and the tragic number of deaths. Suicides are up uh, for a variety of reasons. And we have certainly not won the war on heart disease and cancer, diabetes, brain disease in general. So very disturbing. But if you look at the 79 years we might be allotted and women a little more, men a little less, you can see that about a sixth or maybe even a fifth of life is spent dealing with very serious health challenges for the average American. <clears throat> maybe weight, maybe back issues, maybe brain issues, maybe diabetes, and the complications in the eyes and the nerves, sexual organs, heart disease, heart failure, cancer. It's not a pretty thing. That's why we have so many senior centers and nursing homes and just general poor health in our older years. I had one grandfather that lived to age 89, was swimming in a pool in Miami Beach, had a heart attack the last day of his life. He was vibrant and energetic. That'd be a health span perfect till your last day. We'd all love that. If you work hard at it, you might be lucky to enjoy that. And I had another grandfather that spent eight years in a nursing home with Alzheimer's after one of the most vibrant business careers in Detroit. And nobody wants that, to not even know your own name. So we got to work at it. We got to be a little lucky, but don't wait for luck. You know, you want to grab onto the lifestyle. The reason a heart doctor is relevant to speak about longevity and aging and health and fitness, because I practice traditional cardiology. I'm a member of a hospital staff. I've put in many stents and send people to bypass very rarely now, but I have, is that if you want to live a long and healthy life, you better think about your heart. You can think about a lot of other things. The challenging thing about heart disease is it's still number one. It's been 100 years in a row, the number one cause of death in United States and most Western countries. If it's not number one, it's just slightly below cancer as number two. Uh, they're neck and neck, uh, sadly. But also, it's a silent disease. Right now in this room, there are people that have moderately or maybe even more clogged heart arteries and have no clue. I'm going to talk about that in part because I don't want you to be susceptible to that. You can't wait till you feel bad for heart disease. It may be the day that you know you uh, see the good Lord above because it is your last day. You cannot wait. It can attack you so quickly with no warning. So it's very important that we focus on it. The other reason that you can't rely on the medical system besides the high expense that are dropping death rate is we're all tired. We're tired in this medical field. And these are some amazing data on the number of doctors burned out, stressed, and wouldn't recommend. I'm none of those. I'm not burned out. I'm not stressed. And I would recommend a medical career to my children. None of them did it, but I would. Um, and they did not choose it because anything I ever said, they just never had even the slightest inclination to do that. Oh, yeah. I'm supposed to stand over here. Sorry. Is that better? Everybody feel better? I think it's some kind of vortex. This is Sedona over here or something. I don't know. Anna Marie put this here. It's high energy here, but maybe I'll slide over here. Um, so, I mean, you know, you know your medical visits in general, they're short. Um, your doctor is working on a computer. Might not be your doctor, might be a nurse practitioner, physician assistant. In my former medical practice, cardiology practice, uh, the patients I see now say, we never see the doctor. It's a nurse practitioner, nurse practitioner, nurse practitioner. Nothing wrong with that. But that's not how the original plan was, and it's just the way the system is, you know, uh, is stressed out completely. So you're not going to get a lot of lifestyle education, nor do they get a lot of lifestyle education in general. When there's an exception to that, it's a wonderful and joyful exception. That's the bad news. Good news. You can make important decisions that dramatically improve the odds that you're going to have a healthy, long, robust life, a good health span. Avoid cardiovascular disease and all the things that go with it. Cancer is just another name for cardiovascular disease, and Alzheimer's is, and arthritis is. They all run with the same lifestyle. And maybe you've seen that quote before, your genetics load the gun, your lifestyle pulls the trigger. Some people on the Internet give Dr. Mehmet Oz credit for that statement. Some give Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn. Uh, Abe Lincoln may have said it. That's what it says on the Internet. I'm not sure. But it is a profound statement is that, you know, most of you don't know your genes. If you came to my clinic in Detroit, you would know some of your heart genes because I test them. Um, if you do 23andMe, you can learn more 
I've actually been to San Diego where you can really get your genome checked, your, every gene in your body. But at the end of the day, there are importance to knowing some of them, perhaps. But you can't change your genes, so you better just adopt healthy diet, healthy lifestyle, good sleep, manage stress in some way that's healthy, uh, not narcotics. Um, manage your weight. Use as much natural therapy as you can. And you can overcome most genetic garbage that your parents gave you. And you may have quite a bit that you don't know about, but you got no choice. You got to lead a clean life. So how many people know a lot about the blue zones? Okay, maybe half. Probably that's more than most audiences because you're a sophisticated audience. We can learn lessons for your life from the Blue Zones. What are the Blue Zones? A reporter in 2005, National Geographic's Dan Butner, living in Minneapolis, proposed in National Geographic's, do the women that eat Dan and yogurt on TV and look like they're 100 years old really live the longest lifespan in Russia? Or is that just marketing BS? Can we find out where people really live longer? The definition was areas where there were more people healthy over 100 than the United States by 10 times. Find me a city where there's 10 times more centenarian, century livers, than the average United States community. So after much research, birth records, death records, the ladies eating Dan yogurt weren't the ones, God knows. But it turns out you can see here across the world, a little region in Japan, Okinawa, famous for its purple potatoes, a little area in Greece, Ikaria, a little island famous for its boiled coffee, uh, a little island off of Italy, Sardinia, famous for its Canana wine and laughter. How wonderful. You can buy Canana wine if you're a wine drinker at pretty much any wine store. A little peninsula in Costa Rica that's basically just heaven, uh, paradise. And one city an hour east of Los Angeles, Loma Linda, which in the late 50s was identified. The average lifespan in Loma Linda was 10 years longer than the rest of California, which is an enormous difference. And it prompted a study that led to the obvious realization that the Seventh-day Adventists were very common in Loma Linda, that they preached not smoking, no alcohol, fitness, a plant diet being their strong choice. And we started as a country spending a lot of research money on the Adventists, on the Adventist health study. And what was unique about Dan Butner's analysis of these uh, five areas, and there's many books, and I'd encourage you to read. Uh, there's bluezones.com, I have no connection. There's Blue Zones Solution and Blue Zones Cookbooks. I love getting emails from them every few days because the recipes are amazing. There was a lot in common, and if you look in the middle, the overlap, there's a lot of family ties. These were old-fashioned communities, grandkids knew their grandparents and brothers and sisters. They lived in the same home. Nobody smoked. Ha-ha, plant-based diet. Yes, it's true. There may not be a completely vegan society that's been out there for generation after generation, but there were places like Okinawa where they were eating 95% plants. What are you going to do? There's fish all over the place. It's an island. It'd be silly not to try them if you hadn't come to a conference like this and read a book by Dr. Uh, Clements about uh, killer fish and such. No, they were plant-based diets. They were naturally active, climbing, gardening, working, uh, building uh, things with brick. They had strong social ties. And I love the last one on the list because this list is from 2008 or so. They all ate some sort of legumes, maybe soybeans in Japan, maybe lentils, uh, in Greece, maybe chickpeas in Italy and such. You know, you hear now about legumes being unhealthy and legumes want to kill you and legumes have nutrients called lectins. They want to take you down. And there's a white-haired doctor, Dr. Stephen Gundry, who I've debated on national TV and ate his lunch full of legumes because he says they're going to kill you and it's nonsense. What do people eat that live a long life? They eat a lot unless you have some unusual reaction to them. Uh, beans, peas, and lentils cooked properly in every form you can. I mean, you can eat hummus for breakfast in my house. I don't mind. It's healthy. Uh, I reduce the oil or make your own so it doesn't have uh, industrial oils. And you can see other differences. But so what are the lessons? Family, community, activity, natural foods, plant-based foods, don't smoke. These are lessons for you to live a long and healthy life. More recently, in the last six months, Harvard uh, School of Public Health analyze, they have a database of about 130,000 doctors and nurses, and they've been following them for 32 years. I remember my father-in-law, blessed memory, physician, 
used to fill out these forms, what he ate, whether he exercised, smoked, weight, blood pressure, and they were tracking doctors and nurses to see if they were to develop a variety of diseases. So this is the first time they actually just reported on longevity. And they, you know, you can say, how come they didn't measure antioxidants in the skin? Well, they, you know, they had to go by the database questionnaires they had. So if you responded during these 32 years of follow-up, I eat a lot of fruit and vegetables, whole grains and legumes. I move every day. It can be natural movement like walking. It can be more. I enjoy but don't abuse alcohol and wine. I keep my weight optimal. That's a tough one. When this study started, America was a thin country. Nowadays, to find a person with the standard appropriate weight, it's actually the minority. It's 25% of America. And not smoke. So it doesn't matter if you choose those habits and try and get your weight to the right point and talk about a few clues to that. Does it matter that you don't have the second glass of wine or any at all, maybe? Does it matter, like I did this morning, get out of bed and get some exercise done, even though it's going to be a travel day? Well, it matters, like a lot statistically, the association. If you're a man or a woman and you say, I do all five of those, or you're a man or a woman and say, I rarely do all five of those in a day, it's 12 to 14 years. Who gets more years? The women, always. 14 more years for the women, 12 more years for the men. I know these are associations. These are predictions. They didn't take half of those nurses and doctors and tell them to sit in bed, and half they told them to go to the gym. So there could be other things involved, the communities, the air quality, the water quality, their stress, but at least that can be measured. You'd be pretty smart, you know, to be sure your life has built in as much as possible these lifestyle measures. Lifestyle is the key. Lifestyle is starting to be taught to medical students. Probably the most hopeful thing out there. Let them learn some firm pharmacology and surgery, but let them preach lifestyle and incorporate it in their own life. So let's talk about how you can try using Blue Zones, using Harvard School of Public Health, to live a long and healthy life of which plant diets are the foundation in my world. But we got to come back and circle back to the heart. And we're going to go visit England 400 years ago when this guy with amazing hair, Thomas Sydenham, he was the most famous physician in England during his era, often called the English Hippocrates wrote a medical textbook used for 200 years, and he had the vision based on autopsies to say, you know, the age of arteries predicts overall age of humans. He had no CAT scan, he had no catheterization, he had no stress tests, he had no ultrasound. It really didn't have much relevance because you and I don't want to volunteer for an autopsy to find out the age. But there is something called your arterial age. This is what I do in my clinic. If you're 50, when you're done with me, you're going to know if your arteries are 40, which would be a really good piece of news. Or your arteries are like a 65-year-old, and we got a lot of work to do to work backwards on that. And it is reversible. I will say I have no idea why there's a picture of Saudi Arabia at the upper corner of this. It has absolutely nothing to do with it. The only other time I see silly pictures, they often show a picture of a diet called the Ornish diet with a piece of salmon. We're going to talk about the Ornish diet in a few minutes. It has nothing to do with a piece of salmon, so might as well put one here too. So it is really true. I have a little button in my office that says happiness is clean arteries that I got when I was a heart fellow in Dallas and Kansas City training, thinking the only thing important was how many arteries we could unclog with balloons and stents and bypass. But these are these gorgeous, you know, you have 50,000 miles of arteries in your body. And every artery is lined with a single layer like wallpaper called endothelium. Anybody ever hear of endothelium? Yeah, you know, it's a little joke in elementary school. I see your epithelium. Well, we can't easily see our endothelium, but it's this single layer. It's this amazing wallpaper. When you smoke, you damage it. When you eat spinach, you heal it. When you get overweight, you damage it. When you go to the gym, you heal it. And it's very lifestyle dependent. And these are gorgeous examples of the kind of pipes you want. If you were to take all that endothelium out and lay it out, it would be like seven or eight tennis courts. So you've got to love your endothelium by eating healthy foods and living a healthy lifestyle. If anybody's ever heard Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn lecture, famous Cleveland Clinic doc, he loves to talk about the endothelium. I tried to teach Dr. Esselstyn, and he knows everything. He's my hero. But we actually know now there's a layer of slime on the endothelium, like mucus, and it even more protects your arteries from damage. I mean, we want to be healthy. It's our nature to be healthy. 
And of all things right now, other than all these lifestyle components, the only thing we know of that makes that endothelium mucus layer better, thicker, more protective is beef jerky or seaweed. It's always plants. It's a science. It's amazing. It's some seaweed extract that actually seems to improve the health. It's never animal products in any of these studies that improves the health in any natural sense. The, my friends, my introduction, it may mean nothing to you, but I don't mind getting in the ring with these crazies that are eating meat three times a day. I've been on something called the Joe Rogan Experience podcast, millions of viewers and many others, and they just want to destroy you and beat you up. But I don't know, I just like an annoying mosquito to them. But they can't show this. They can't talk about healing with bacon, the endothelium, quite the opposite. So let's get practical because, you know, there's a lot of, things you can do. Somebody in the room might have this problem. These are what heart arteries look like with a catheter, heart catheterization. Inject the dye. It's called an angiogram. And that arrow points to a very severe blockage at the beginning of the most important artery of the heart, termed the widow maker. After you do everything else at this conference, if you have a moment, there is a movie on Netflix. I didn't own it. I don't, uh, you know, get a revenue called the widow maker movie. Quite a remarkable documentary about this artery, how it can cause a heart attack suddenly um, and uh, lead to, unfortunately, tragedy and how it is detectable. And that doesn't give you any symptoms in so many people till you're playing ice hockey and you collapse and die like my dear friend, Victoria Dupuy's uh, dear husband, Dean, did at age 45 in San Jose, California. We had a dentist in Detroit three weeks ago. Dr. Platt playing hockey, 59, boom. It's always the same artery, always the same problem, always hardly any warning uh, or no warning. And it's tragic. So three quick clues, nothing to do with plant diets, everything to do with technology or medical science. Why do I have Steven Spielberg up here? Because he has this unusual crease in his earlobe that an internal medicine doctor in New York City 50 years ago reported in a major journal Oddly, when I sit in my office and see people with heart disease, they have a crease in their earlobe. And oddly, when I sit in my office and see people with other problems, they don't have a crease in their earlobe. And I think this is some kind of unusual clue. It became known as Frank sign, because that was Dr. Frank. It was forgotten to about the last 10 years, and we have technology now. Uh-oh. Help me, help me. I probably hit a button. Or... The, my friends in the meat community figured out how to hack into the computer. And just a minute, you're going to see slides of bacon healing the endothelium. I know it. Stop it. They are that aggressive. It's all that meat. You should see how aggressive they are. Anybody on Twitter? I have a, yeah, very few. Yeah. You have to be an ugly human to be on Twitter. Um, a friend of mine says it's where angry old men fight it out. And I think that's true. And I am an angry old man. So... Dr. Frank, but now we have the technology I'll show you in a minute to actually determine if anybody walking down the street has bad arteries, and it's holding up pretty well, about 70% accurate. Don't look at your neighbor to the right or left, but later look at your own earlobes and see, or just Google or go to Bing. I want to be non-commercial. I don't care where you go. You'll see many examples. I've written, I've written an entire book on this called Dead Execs Don't Get Bonuses, or you know what you can learn from your earlobe. It actually is moderately accurate. I didn't say perfectly. And I do see people in the office that have the crease and they prove to have no disease, but it certainly is the office way. Next is we're at a hotel. There's bedrooms, there's beds. There could be some nookie going on tonight, but there will be some rooms where nookie's not going to work so well because of a male problem called erectile dysfunction. Everybody know what nookie is? Do I have to go any further on that? I got, I got props. I can do things. Okay, you guys are good. You're a good crowd, I tell you. That's Give it up. But it is sad case. A man will start to have some issues. Go to the primary care doc. Go to even the urologist. Here's a prescription, Viagra, Levitra, Cialis, without the question. Hmm. You know, this will take care of it for a while, but maybe there's a problem with your circulation. Maybe we should check your cholesterol, your blood sugar, your blood pressure, your health, your fitness, your diet, your sleep, your stress. Maybe we should actually look at your heart to see if this is a clue because in the medical literature, very well described, erectile dysfunction is three to four years before a heart attack. It's an opportunity to 
find out the truth before there's tragedy. That's what the canary in the coal mine is. Miners 100 years ago didn't want to die of carbon monoxide poisoning, odorless, tasteless. They would bring a bird in a cage. If the bird stopped chirping, the bird was getting poisoned. They would run out of the mine and avoid carbon monoxide. It's an early warning system. So no, you don't have to put a bird in a cage in your bedroom. If it stops chirping, you have vascular problem. You need to get serious about this problem because there are other causes, testosterone, thyroid, emotional, and the rest nerve. Uh, you're for a long distance biker, you might have injured some nerves down there. But nonetheless, it's very commonly vascular and all. And finally, this is the precise way, and I'm going to get back to food in a minute, that you can determine anybody nowadays, technology moves forward. Maybe 20 years ago, an executive physical or a routine visit to your internist was, how do you feel? Let me listen to your heart. Let's get some routine labs. I'll see you next year, Joe and Jane. It's simply not adequate anymore. It's not grandpa's you know, Oldsmobile anymore because there is no Oldsmobile. So we're going to return right now to the topic of prevention and then detection because we were talking before, Blue Zones and Harvard were talking about overall longevity. If you don't want to have a heart attack, oh, it's the same list pretty much as Harvard had for longevity. This is from large studies around the world. Don't smoke, move your body. Eat all those things in the produce department, the farmer's market, your personal garden, not the meat counter, not the fish counter, not the poultry counter. God knows not the candy and the processed food and the frozen food in the middle counter. Enjoy a few alcoholic beverages, but don't overdo it. And the new one on the list for heart disease specifically is sleep. A study in 2011 here, 2013, and a study just six weeks ago identified the new studies from Madrid that people that sleep less than six hours a night have an increased risk of silent worsening of arteries throughout the body. It might be that it goes along with other things. You sleep and you grab bad food and you don't go to the gym and you're stressed out and you gain weight, but it's an easy thing to measure. And people that sleep seven to eight hours a night have far less of this silent heart artery blockage. But let's detect the problem like a mammogram or a thermogram or a colonoscopy which simply doesn't exist. Who would have ever predicted on outward appearance what your doctor is using, your nurse practitioner, your naturopath? That's who would have predicted Winston Churchill versus Jim Fix, a runner, an athlete, an author who dropped dead of a heart attack, and Winston Churchill who lived a good long life. So there's all kinds of tools. This is the last little bit of the cardiology talk. But there is, I don't like CAT scans. I'm not a fan of radiation. I don't like flying because there's radiation, but there is. So Take a handful of chlorella, right? Actually, chlorella right from Hippocrates. That's where my chlorella comes from, actually. I love chlorella. Actually, I eat chlorella. I actually like the flavor. I'll tell you how long I've been plant-based. I just let it melt in my mouth. Not too many do that. Um, I don't like giving people CAT scans. I fight it. I used to do nuclear stress tests on patients. I don't do that anymore. It's a huge amount of radiation. But there is a CAT scan that takes 10 seconds. It's a very low dose of radiation. No IV, no iodine injected, no exercise. If you've had bypass, a stent, a clogged artery defined somewhere, you don't need it. But if you're like most people, I see my doctor, he tells me everything's okay, but it doesn't need any but. But my cholesterol's a little borderline, or my blood pressure's been a little issue, or my blood sugar's a little bit high, or my brother just had that bypass, or my sister has a stent. For about $75 in my city, maybe you'll pay 100 you get a CAT scan, and the CAT scan can tell you in 10 seconds if you're A, B, or C. A, you've got young arteries that have no bone in your arteries. That's called hardening the arteries. Or maybe you're like C. You have no symptoms, but you've got horribly aged arteries that can be detected in 10 seconds. Coronary artery calcium scan. Sadly, you do need a doctor's prescription in most states, not every state. So I give out, doctor, I give out prescriptions for this like candy. Um, you need to ask your primary care doctor specialist for it if you want one. Uh, in the state of Texas, the data is so strong for this. If you are a citizen of the state of Texas, you get one of these free at age 50. One legislator who is highlighted in that movie called The Widowmaker Movie got a legislative uh, approval that everybody gets one as an insurance benefit, just to tell you the kind of strength there is scientifically for this. So I just hate reading. I have a little Google alert, heart attacks, and every morning, I'm telling you, there's 10, 15 stories around the United States of somebody who dropped dead, police chief, fireman, school teacher, 
you know, it's only somebody like that or a celebrity that's going to end up with a newspaper article. But it's 2,000 people a day in the United States dying of heart attacks, or a minimum 1,000 of them are completely unnecessary, sadly. And it's just tragic. I mean, I care. It's tragic. Get the darn CT scan. Eat your plants. Okay, let's turn to my favorite topic. This damn disease is reversible. It's okay to say damn. I won't do the F word. Okay, I promised Steve if I say the F word, he can't invite me back. But uh, it, we'll say the D word, the damn word. This disease is reversible. So let me take you through that because I think it's such a cute story. This is Norway. This is 1940s. This is World War II. This is when German regime comes in and takes all the animals out of a country it occupies to take them back and feed the troops and the public and the regime. And people have to eat largely plant-based, out of gardens, out of forests. They smoke less, admittedly. Uh, they certainly didn't have less stress. And overall death rates go down. And when this was reported in the late 1940s, it was exactly the opposite of what most, most people anticipated. Probably death rates went up in these occupied countries. I'm not talking, obviously, in death camps. I'm just talking in the general populace. There were no death camps in Norway. And some researchers saw that data. And if you see the second picture, that is not Dr. Lester Morrison. You probably might recognize if you're under the age of 50 or 60 that that is a different Morrison, uh, Jim Morrison and the Doors. He didn't do all that well with lifespan either. But out of that came an internal medicine doctor in Los Angeles you've never heard of, I imagine, but I wish you had, who said, I'm going to start treating my heart patients in 1948. I have nothing to offer these people, and I'm going to give them the Norway diet because he knew the data. I'm going to create a diet list for them and I'm going to tell them to eat like you were trapped in Norway with no animals. And you're going to get rid of cream and butter and organ meats. You're going to stop eating, you know, egg yolks. We're going to be poor, rustic diet. And he actually did it as a research study. He took 100 patients in Los Angeles in the late 40s that had had a heart attack already. So these are the real deal. Half of them, he said, just enjoy your diet. Half of them, he encouraged them. I think I can help your health with this crazy cockamamie diet that nobody calls the Norway diet or the Nazi diet or the Morrison diet, but we should. He published this data. This is medical journal, medical literature, but this is the key finding. If you look out there 12 years, nobody was alive from his original 50 patients if they didn't change their diet. The diet that got them heart disease got them dead. For those who were willing to stop eating animal and high fat foods and oils and butters and cheeses, they actually had a 50% survival before balloons, before bypass, before stents, before statins, before anything like that. Food works, and we should celebrate that. And that should have been the beginning of food-based cardiology care, you know, by the mid-1950s when Eisenhower had his heart attack, 1955. It's too hard. I don't believe it. The numbers weren't big enough. Everybody says this over and over. There actually was one doctor in 1955 who sort of got this. The chief of cardiology at Harvard was a guy named Paul Dudley White, MD. Well-traveled, brilliant man. And when Eisenhower had his heart attack, he was called from Boston to go down to Washington to be at his bedside, became his cardiologist. And he made this statement, which I live by, that a heart attack after age 80 is an act of God. That's what he said. But a heart attack before age 80 is a failure of the medical system. He said that in 1955. It's kind of like citing him saying you're as old as your arteries in the 1600s. Like, you know, that we could stop heart attacks. He said that in 1955. Morrison had already basically shown it. One guy in California that paid attention to Dr. Lester Morrison, and if you do go to Cedar sinai Hospital, I gave Grand Rounds lectures there a little more than a year ago. It's the Lester Morrison Medical Auditorium, so he's not totally forgotten, but Nobody in the auditorium knew who he was, I asked. But Mr. Pritikin was an aerospace engineer. How many people know the name Pritikin? Okay. How many people knew he was an aerospace engineer? Not too many. He had many patents. He was building parts for the Air Force. And he heard of Morrison. Morrison's stuff got in the paper. And he drove down from Santa Barbara to Los Angeles. He had his cholesterol check. He was about 44. His cholesterol was 325. That's even higher than the average American back then. It was very high back then. Um, Dr. Morrison had him do a little stress test. He flunked the stress test. Morrison said, you want to see the graph of everybody dead or you want to see the graph of survivors? You better take this list and start eating like this. Pritikin wasn't an average guy. He reminds me 
in concept like Dr. Esselstyn. He was bright. He was motivated. He started reading medical articles before the Internet and books, and he said, I can change my diet. I can start exercising. I can lose weight, all of which he did. And he became a guru, but he was a guru without an MD degree, and that was not well celebrated. A lot of pushback, a lot of difficulties. Ultimately opened a treatment center with some MDs, in Santa Barbara, moved it to Santa Monica, known as the Pritikin Center for Longevity, moved it ultimately after his death to uh, Miami Beach. So between the Pritikin Center for Longevity and Miami Beach and Hippocrates Health, the West Palm, they kind of like own longevity, different programs for sure, but nonetheless proven. And they started to publish data. So this is one literature out of about 120 articles, 4,000 patients who stayed three weeks at the Pritikin Center. They ate plants. They learned to cook without oil. They learned to understand that excess sugar is a problem. They learned to move and exercise. They improved all their numbers, and they kept going. So quite a remarkable feat for an engineer, no doubt. And he was very humble. All I'm trying to do is wipe out heart disease, diabetes, hypertension, obesity. And we actually followed his program. We probably could do 90% of that. You know, genetics do matter, but uh, lifestyle is stronger. And then came this funny picture, and some of you will recognize that on your right is Dr. Dean Ornish, and on your left is not Dr. Dean Ornish. On your left is a guy named Sachi Dananda, a very famous Indian philosopher and guru, very well known. He opened Woodstock with the prayer before all the craziness of Woodstock. He was kind of a, a hippie type. But Dr. Ornish actually was very close and was influenced at a very young age. Uh, about Eastern medicine, Eastern diet, meditation, and stress. And as a very bright Dallas-based uh, young man and then a Harvard medical student and a Baylor uh, internal medicine doctor, he started doing research, asking the question, I know there's this guy Morrison, there's this guy Pritikin, but I've got technology, I've got funding. Can we really prove that eating vegetables and fruits and beans and legumes, there they are again, and whole grains, and if you look over in that box and we cut out oils and meats and olives and avocados, can we take really sick heart patients and actually turn around their disease using technology to monitor it? But we got to do more than diet. We got to add some exercise. We got to add some stress reduction with yoga and meditation. We got to obviously quit smoking. We got to do a lot of social support, love, and uh, building people up. So he got the funding to do a real study published three weeks after I began cardiology practice. I started July 1, 1990. I read this journal three weeks later. I said, darn, you know, my family's been eating this way for 13 years. No idea this was actually a therapy for heart disease. Nobody really did. I had never heard of Pritikin during those 13 years. Nobody taught that in medical training. But Dr. Ornish showed that lifestyle based with a plant diet and yoga and meditation, he published more data five years later and he published this diagram, which I have hanging in my office. Real quickly, there's, it says baseline one year, five years. These were serious heart patients that agreed for a research study to have a heart catheterization, pictures made at baseline one year and five years of research, analyzed by a computer, looking at how much narrowing, stenosis they have, how much blockage. And what was found is half the patients were told to eat the American Heart Association diet. Those are the black circles. They got worse and worse and worse with time. So I think there's some good stuff the American Heart Association does with CPR training. But if you follow their diet, you're aging, you're getting worse. It's not enough. Moderation and everything means you're aging. And if you follow the plant diet and the stress reduction, if you look at the white boxes, your arteries actually cleaned out. The first time ever documented, 1990, 1998, that you can reverse years, months, decades of blocked arteries with changing your diet, changing your mental state, changing your fitness. It should have, again, dramatically changed the treatment. I should have been teaching that to fellows and residents. I taught it to patients. I mean, to this day, if you walked into a major place like Mayo, Cleveland Clinic, Harvard, um, you will, and, and NYU, and you ask people, who's Dr. Ornish in the cardiology department? Who's Mr. Pritikin, the response rate would be under 10%, I would estimate. It's absolutely crazy that this hasn't uh, materialized to be as life-changing as it should. But it's not ignored. If you look just four weeks ago, U.S. News & World Report is one way to assess uh, where the public's eye is. And you look at the bottom, best heart-healthy diets. 
the Ornish diet has for eight or nine years been listed number one. People in the science world know this is radical and amazing stuff. If you look at the very bottom of the list, one of the worst diets in general and for heart disease, they're actually the three most popular diets were judged to be the worst by many scholars, the ketogenic diet, the paleo diet, and the Whole30 diet. They will help you lose weight, but you can lose weight with cancer, and we don't recommend that. You can lose weight with HIV, we don't recommend that. You don't want to lose weight and mortgage your future health, which is what those three programs do, whereas the Ornish diet, you lose weight and you benefit in terms of your future health, more likely than not. This also wasn't ignored by our government, because even though Pritikin did his work in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and it's ongoing, Ornish in the 80s and 90s, it took the government, and that means the people that actually pay patient bills, Medicare, till 2010. But in 2010, they really looked at the data and said, really, if a heart patient goes to a program and learns Dr. Ornish's program, or a heart patient goes to Pritikin and learns Pritikin program, we actually see them spending less money. They go to the hospital less. They need less procedures. That really works out well. We're an insurance company. Spending less money is good. And they actually approve these programs. And to this day, you can go online and say, where's there an Ornish heart program? Because he, it's like a franchise. Where's there a Pritikin heart program? Sadly, there's not enough of them. In my state of Michigan, there's one single program, a Pritikin heart program in Ann Arbor, Michigan. So I'm in suburban Detroit. I have to ask my patients. They get approval by their insurance company to learn to cook, to learn to eat different, to learn to exercise, to learn to meditate, to learn about heart physiology. They get much more training than the average heart patient in what's called cardiac rehab, and it's all covered as a benefit. But there should be one you know, in every major city, uh, and it's difficult to find. I don't think there's one in New York City, which is seriously sad, really, because there should be with all the people. I won't go through this, but Dr. Ornish keeps doing studies. He's shown that you can shrink prostate cancer in a man, that is a man thing, with the same diet, lifestyle, stress reduction. That's a pretty big piece of news. I can't talk about this topic without at least giving a hug to a Cleveland Clinic legend, Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn, probably the most intelligent and vibrant 83 or 84 year old out there, uh, I, a surgeon, Anybody know why Dr. Esselstyn, a surgeon of thyroid and breast tissue, got interested in heart disease? It's such a cute story. So his last name starts with an E, and they were redoing the surgical locker room at the Cleveland Clinic, and they had to have people share lockers for a while. So the next surgeon after E was F, that's Dr. Favalero. Dr. Favalero was the first surgeon to do bypass surgery in the world at the Cleveland Clinic, but in the world. So E and F had to share and put their gym shoes and put their dirty scrubs. They became very good friends. Dr. Esselstyn, a bit like Mr. Pritikin, just a bright mind. What's this disease you treat and why would a bypass help? And how come you don't change anything about these people? He developed a program at the Cleveland Clinic to bring sick, sick heart patients to his home. And he and his wife, Ann, would cook for them and educate them and every two weeks assess them. And it was the same general diet. Eat real food. Don't throw all kinds of garbage on it. And don't throw animals on it. Uh, naturally low in fat, low in sugar. Naturally rich in vitamins and minerals and fiber and water. And he showed that people got better and people reversed blockages. He didn't have all the funding. Not that Dr. Ornish had such excessive funding. He didn't have all the funding to do an angiogram in every patient. But there are these very famous angiograms of people feeling better, stress tests better, catheterization. It's really a miracle. It truly is that this is unknown in most of cardiology. But that's why it's worth finding out with that CAT scan if you might have the problem because there is a therapy. Now, you can take the approach, I already eat this way, so what can I do different if I find out? But I still would encourage you to find out because there always is a little bit more. Go to Hippocrates, get detoxified, and all kinds of fun stuff. In my own clinic in Detroit, I feel like a mini Pritikin, a mini Ornish, a mini Esselstyn. And I don't say that humbly because I use an ultrasound you can do of the neck. So, because I can't tell people go get a catheterization just for the fun of it. And I can show that blockages, a 41% blockage in the left carotid artery to the brain is now 21% blocked. And a, 34% blockage is now less than 20% blocked. These are people that change their diet, lower their blood pressure, lower their cholesterol, 
I do use some natural supplements that have science that show that it improves plaque and literally can turn back the clock. It's just amazing how often we can see the body heal itself, respond. It only makes sense when you stop to think about it. If people are getting clogged up and dying of smoking, poor diets, stress, and lack of exercise, and you can convince them to get their diet good, quit smoking, start exercising, and manage stress, you would think that the process at a minimum would stop, and it does, and it might actually go backwards, and it does. So that's the great stuff. Just a quick case study. This is a Detroit legend. This is a U of M uh, defensive end named Mark Ramirez, 1990 to 1994. And when he came out, he was a lean, mean, you know, football machine guy. But how many athletes stay in the gym as many hours as when they're in college? He got an executive position, got a wife, got kids, got a schedule. And, you know, within 10 years, it didn't quite look like a great Wolverine that was going to charge down a Buckeye and tackle him. Uh, he was overweight, and he was quickly told he was Latino, Mark Ramirez, very high percentage of diabetics in the Latino community, particularly that he was a type 2 diabetic and cholesterol and blood pressure and erectile dysfunction. You don't need a doctor to tell you that. You know that. And began to accumulate what we accumulate early in life, too, in his 30s and 40s, medications and needles and blood tests and hospital visits. He was very concerned because diabetes had ruined his mother's health, his brother's health, his sister's health with all the complications. And he had accumulated the, uh, the medications. I see Genuvia, Metformin, Simvastatin, insulin, all this stuff. And he didn't know any way out. How many medical people tell a patient about reverse, get rid of, eliminate? It's always managed. We're going to manage your disease. And indeed, his in-laws about seven years ago, six, seven years ago, said, you know what? You really ought to watch this DVD. You really ought to watch and read this book. There's others. Dr. Gabriel Cousins has a book on reversing diabetes, uh, Brian Clements, um, and others. But Mark Ramirez got serious and said, God, nobody for 10, 15 years has said you can reverse this disease. I just got to go back. The humor is he had to go back to eating like a traditional Latino. I mean, corn tortillas and simple beans and simple salsa and some simple you know, foods and not Western diet that he'd been eating. And, you know, within a few months, and this is not that unusual, he's just a wonderful spokesman in Detroit. He's been featured in Forks Over Knives uh, magazine many times. You know, he's no medication, no weight issues, no diabetes issues, no blood pressure, no cholesterol, no erectile dysfunction. You know, he's over 50 now. He's a mean, lean, healthy machine. I mean, that's what insurance companies ought to pay for because he's now costing the medical system, you know, pennies a year, not... Uh, it's estimated something like $14,000 a year for a typical diabetic care to an insurance company. So wonderful self-care. The more you put into it, the more you might get back. I can't guarantee my patients are all going to reverse every medical illness, but the more they work at it, the more likely they'll see benefit. Uh, and if they're not getting the benefit, we got to ask why, what, what other factors are going on. So just to conclude the heart part of this to some degree, you can see the yellow line, that's what's never taught, sadly, so far in medical school, that you can get worse with age, well, we know that, but you can actually work actively to reverse it because the science of healthy aging and healthy longevity and health span is real science. In fact, that's where I wanna turn, but I wanna talk just for a couple minutes before that. Where are common pitfalls, roadblocks that people get into, and one is, the these are obviously junk food, but, you know, the number of options that say vegan or plant-based in the frozen department, the fresh department, whether they're cheeses, pizzas, mac and cheese, uh, meat substitutes is exploding in a multi-billion dollar business. And once in a blue moon, you're on the road and there's a white castle and they have a black bean burger. I've never had it, but there is three different plant burgers in white castle and Taco Bell just announced a big push for more vegan options, and even McDonald's is finally demoing a vegan burger and such. But most of them should be avoided other than rare, you know, circumstances. I'd always rather you skip a meal. Eat whole food, whiff-a-bib, whole food plant-based. Everybody say whiff-a-bib. Say it with me, whiff-a-bib, whiff-a-bib. It's a meaningless word, but it's so much fun to say. What diet do you follow? Whiff-a-bib. You haven't heard of the whiff-a-bib diet? Another problem can be vitamin deficiencies. We could argue all day long. I hate arguing amongst vegans. We should be unified or plant eaters. 
But B12, you probably need. At least get a blood level. Vitamin D and omega-3 from algae is a reasonable choice. Um, Dr. Michael Greger would say this is a great choice. Dr. Joel Furman would say the same thing, although he has his own brands. So nothing wrong with that. It's an honor business. So I want to shift gears a little bit. Um, I heard Pam Popper talk for a minute about fasting. I could give you 90 minutes on fasting, but I want to give you 20 minutes on fasting. And number one, there is this term intermittent fasting, and generally the scientists say it means nothing. Because, you know, you went to bed last night, you woke up this morning, had breakfast, you didn't eat for 10 or 14 hours. Is that intermittent fasting? The scientists say no. In fact, you're not really fasting until you're 24, 30, 36 hours without food, and you're starting to see there's stuff in your liver called glycogen, and you're starting to use it up, glycogen depletion. So that's overnight. In fact, if you have a plan, and I'd encourage you, I don't eat from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. I don't eat from... 7 p.m. to 9 a.m., 12, 14 hours. That's actually called time-restricted feeding, TRF. If you want to be cool, if you want to be scientifically accurate, intermittent fasting doesn't mean much. But I want to teach you about something called fasting-mimicking diet, uh, something that uses plant-based foods. It is approachable. It isn't onerous on your lifestyle, something Dr. Popper appropriately pointed out. How many people want to eat nothing day after day after day after day? I mean, it's not going to retain many people. but could you eat almost nothing a few days in a row if you know it's really good for your health? That is my grandfather, the one swimming in the pool at age 89 or 90, uh, a very good health span. So this is a provocative uh, question that science is focusing on. If we could cure heart disease, cancer, diabetes, and strokes right now, how many extra years would we add to our lives? I don't expect you to know the answer. There are such projections, and the answer is 13 years. So we go from 79 to 92, I think that's right, I don't know, and actually health span would clearly go up if we could get rid of those diseases. But 92, what would happen if we really can get our hands around aging itself? And I won't go into deep, I'm gonna go a little bit into it, but the science, really authentic science of why we age, why do we lose abilities, why do our, basically our cells get old so we get old and then we plunk over, why does that happen? And, you know, yes, there are things that accelerate it, like smoking and poor diet. But really on a biochemical level, why does it happen and can we intervene and does food have anything to do with it? Because it's been estimated if we could figure out how to stop aging ourselves so they don't function anymore, we might be able to add more years. And maybe you don't want to, but if, you know, it was really healthy, good years, maybe you do want to. I was on the Larry King show. We recorded in September a segment on healthy aging. He was very sincere. He just turned 85 in November. He's been married to the same woman. It's his eighth wife, but this one stuck for about 24 years. I think he married the same woman like four times. So to say he's been married eight times is just a little of his own psychosis. Uh, but he's married. He's got kids that are like 19 and 20. He's got a good life in terms of, you know, celebrity and uh, a young Sean Hegeman is his wife's name. He wants to live to 150, 200, and so does Jeff Bezos, and so does Bill Gates, and so does Larry Ellison. They're spending money to figure it out, and we all may benefit, just like the NASA project gave us Velcro and Tang. These crazy people may give us stuff that really helps us stay healthy. So I want to talk a little bit about this topic and how food fits in. So it turns out we always talk about food, 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 food. We actually have systems in our body that do real well when we don't do food, don't do food, don't do food. And as I say, there actually is a survival pathway that if you stop eating once in a while, and I'll show you a trick, you don't even have to stop eating. This is like making it too easy for you. You actually may turn on something you've never turned on because I don't do water fasting. I'm interested in trying it sometime. I just haven't done it. I've gone a day without eating. That's hardly enough to trigger what I'm about to tell you about. But most of us, if you said, do you eat two or three meals or four or five or six every day after day after day? You've not turned on some pathways that may slow aging and help your body heal. And this isn't just hearsay. This is science that won the Nobel Prize in Medicine in 2016, something called autophagy. Dr. Popper talked about 25 ways to augment autophagy, of which fasting is only one, but it is one, and it's a very well-studied one uh, to help repair your body. So, real science now, okay? I'm not talking anymore about CAT scans and all. 
It, this is largely the work of a scientist I'll introduce to you in a minute. But if you look where it says yeast, it turns out who the heck cares about yeast? It's an infection not to get, but it does make beer, so celebrate that. But if you put yeast in a dish and you feed them less, particularly less sugar in their broth and less amino acids, amino acids are the building block of protein, they will live 10 times longer than yeast that are in the standard broth. And beyond that, that's why it says glucose and amino acid. The specific reasons less sugar and less protein amino acids um, uh, lead to that extended lifespan is actually known certain pathways that cause aging, where it says TOR and RAS. Aging pathways get turned off when you have less sugar and less protein amino acids. And it says at the bottom, anti-aging. And it's actually pretty well figured out. The miracle was, from a scientific standpoint, when they then studied worms, which are a little more complex than yeast, same pathways, same response. Feed worms, their worm feed, but less sugar and less protein amino acids. Take flies, take mice. Mice will live about twice as long. Yeast get the better of it. But give little mice um, their feed, low in sugar, low in amino acid proteins. They will live longer. They will look healthier. They don't turn on that TOR green one. They don't turn on that RES. It's amazing that the pathways are conserved from yeast all the way through, and they're in us. So there's clearly enormous science. We have these pathways. When we eat a lot of sugar, we turn on aging pathways. I'm no fan of sugar. And when we eat a lot of animal protein amino acids, we turn on aging pathways. The butchers don't like us talking about that. It's much less with plant-based amino acid mixes, but it's true. And so out of that has come a dietary approach. What if we created a diet, very low in sugar, very low in amino acid protein, also low in calorie, it sort of starves us, and it um, will turn off aging pathways. So for 25 years, this very dapper Italian-born scientist, Dr. Walter Longo, who spends most of his year in Los Angeles and some of it in Milan, Italy, doing basic science that has already won him most every scientific award a 51-year-old scientist can win. He's single, you should go after him, he's cute as can be. Um, he's a good friend now, um, and may ultimately win him the Nobel Prize in Medicine, that level of science. Uh, you know, ask the question, I'm a basic scientist, I got this big aging research lab in Los Angeles, well, what can I do to help people now? People with aging, people with cancer, people with brain disease. And he's been studying all over the world what he can apply with this. And bottom line, he went in, I'm not joking, in the kitchen 10 years ago, said, I'm going to start making mouse chow. I'm going to make earthworm chow. I'm going to play with the ingredients and see if I can create a way to feed them low in sugar, low in amino acid, and see if I can get them to live longer without completely fasting. Not that fasting doesn't work. It's just, you'll hear Dr. Clapper, it's just not necessarily applicable at home. You, for many people, need to be an inpatient to do a prolonged water fast. It may work, but would you like to do something at home while you're going to work every day and not need to travel to a place like True North? Not in competition, but just another approach. So indeed, he developed a diet in his kitchen, in the university kitchen, that is now called the fasting mimicking diet. You can eat a little bit, but you get the same response as not eating at all. There's protein restriction, there's some calorie restriction, there's low glycemic, meaning there's foods that don't bump your sugar so you don't activate those pathways. It's called nutrient sensing pathways. It allows these cells to have a few days to turn on what well, we turn on when we're starving. When we're starving, we better protect our body because we're in trouble. Well, we can starve ourselves while still eating if that's not a crazy concept, but it's not my genius, it's just I ran into this about two and a half years ago. So he started studying very advanced studies in mice and found they lived longer and all. But he created this for humans. And it's not my company. This is the University of Southern California company where there's a box. What's the miracle when I heard about it two and a half years ago? It's plant-based food, real food, non-GMO food, gluten-free food, soups and teas and nut bars, reasonably high in fat for five days because he believes you can torture people for five days. There is food to eat. It's a little difficult to eat only 800 calories a day for five days in a row. It's not so hard. Then you go back to a healthy, hopefully whole food, real food diet. And you can do this once a month. You can do it once a quarter. 
You could do it once a year, <clears throat> but why would you want to? Because it activates anti-aging pathways that promote longevity and health. There is a randomized study, that's what all this is. There's publications in the highest level science in humans that shows this. If you look at the upper left body weight, this is, would you take five days a month, three months in a row? So you got 15 days out of 90 are your, your days, but only five days in a month to lose weight, to lose belly fat, to get your waist thinner, to not lose muscle mass. That's what lean body mass. But if you look at the bottom right, C-reactive protein, inflammation goes down. And the miracle here is that this stress to the body causes stem cells to come out of the bone marrow, to circulate around, find your sore hip, find your Achilles tendonitis, find your brain injury, find areas of the body that are in trouble, and stem cells can regenerate our tissues. In animal models, we know it works. It actually causes the mice of brain to get bigger. It causes the lining of multiple sclerosis cells in animal models to regrow, and the multiple sclerosis goes away. This is all high-level published science. I would never mislead you. But in humans, we got many studies to do. There's very fertile research going on. If you're a woman with breast cancer <clears throat> getting chemotherapy, and you do this during the days you're getting chemotherapy, you're actually showing right now preliminary results. You're getting a much better response. It causes the healthy cells not to get damaged, and it causes the cancer cells to get whacked a little harder. Amazing stuff. It's just food, too. There's nothing in that box but food. Uh, if you're really in trouble, if you're a healthy person in Los Angeles in this study, but you're a little chubbier and you're a little sicker, you get even more weight loss and even more inflammation reduction uh, and such. So quite a remarkable program that's been available through the University of Southern California. Uh, that little box, I think the name was there, it's called P-R-O-L-O-N, like the word prolonged life. You have to like olives and you have to be able to eat nuts. And I've never seen so many people whine about olives in my life. I did not know that there's a olive whiner group, but they all are in my practice. So here's some of those terms. Calorie restriction, try and eat less every day. Who's good at that? No, I'm not good at that. But you might lose weight, lower your cholesterol, blood sugar, using food. Intermittent fasting doesn't mean much. Maybe one day you eat and one day you don't. Time-restricted feeding, that's the one that I would recommend, 12, 13 hours a day. You might lose weight, cholesterol, fasting, but it's not enough to cause rejuvenation, getting younger. Um, prolonged fasting can do most of those good things, but you're not using food. That's called water fasting in True North. And this fasting-mimicking diet seems to be a unique niche. Um, right now, there's no home kit. You could try and do this at home. I'm going to eat about 800 calories a day, but the program is patented and licensed and carefully protected by the University of Southern California. Dr. Longo the, makes no money on this. He's a researcher. All the money goes to research funds and charities. His book, he's got a book called Longevity Diet. All the money goes to research funds and charities. Uh, very important. He's a most authentic scientist I've ever been around. So we're changing the paradigm that maybe we can actually get to the aging process. We can actually, you can all say, I cut down the sugar in my diet because I don't want to activate the PK-RAS pathway. Boy, your friends won't know what you're talking about. Or I eat less animal protein in my diet, hopefully none, because I don't want to activate mTOR. I mean, we actually know this stuff, and it works, and it's substantiated by human studies. Very cool stuff. Okay, last few minutes. How radical is it? 42 years for me, I'm not sure for you, to talk about eating only plants in your diet. You're going to go to Hippocrates Health, you're going to get alfalfa sprouts and pea sprouts and juice and green juice and all kinds of wonderful vegetables. Is that crazy? Are we tree huggers? So this is what the USDA said in 2011, very pretty, half your plate fruits and vegetables, so at least half not crazy, quarter your plate grains or three quarters not crazy, and the last quarter is some kind of protein. They had the cojones not to say meat because meat, has protein, fat, and carbohydrate, not much carbohydrate, but there are things like beans and peas and lentils. And this was a breakthrough, and of course the government wants you to buy and encourage the dairy industry they're in cahoots with, so drink eight cups of milk a day, crazy. So are we crazy? Two months later, this is 2011, Harvard School of Public Health. Could you live with this being the food plate in your school, in your hospital, maybe in your home? Half the plate fruits and vegetables, now it's not grains, it's whole grains, recognizing that's a better choice for fiber and nutrients. 
It's healthy protein. So bacon isn't on the menu anymore. It says right there, cold cuts aren't on the menu. We got rid of milk. We put in water. Hallelujah. Leave Elsie the cow alone. And uh, we're talking about staying active because it's more than food, although it's mainly food. So this is not crazy to talk about eating a plant-based, plant-strong, plant-predominant, plant-only diet. It's very consistent with the government, with the Harvard School of Public Health. There is, of course, a plant-only option. This actually was published two years before the USDA as a choice you can follow and do well with. And the largest dietetic group in the world is the American Dietetic Association in 2016 said, I don't care if you're pregnant, a baby, a child, an adult, an elderly, this can work. Be a little careful with it. You know, it doesn't work with Pringles. It doesn't work with just vegetable broth. You got to eat some real substantial food. So last two points, I say that, I'm not sure how many more slides I have. I have no idea, um, which is okay, because I can, uh, I'll tell you jokes later. But in the last three weeks, we've seen two major breakthroughs because there's a war out there between meat crazy and dairy crazy and a paleo and ketogenic diet people. And I want to stop so you can ask questions. But this is a report two weeks ago by 37 scientists in 16 countries commissioned by a foundation called the EAT Foundation, just a cute little acronym. Can you dive into science and make a recommendation for the optimal health of the planet and when in 2050 there's 10 billion people living on the planet, what's the best diet to possibly feed 10 billion people and still have a clean earth? And you can see what they came up with. Headlines all over the world two weeks ago. Eat Lancet says, dramatic cutback in meat products, dramatic doubling of plant products, half the plate, fruits and vegetables. Most of the plate is whole grains, legumes, beans and peas. There's all kinds of meat crazy people. I don't want to offend anybody audience. I want to offend anybody watching at home. If you're meat crazy, I'm offending you. Showing pictures that this is like one meatball a week. These people have gone crazy. Um, no, that is have one meatball a week or less. I mean, you can do it with uh, lentils anyways. If you really, you know, if you had a bandage over your eyes, you wouldn't know what you're eating anyways. It tastes so good. So Eat Lancet is this huge, massive worldwide study that has gotten headlines. It's great support for everything you're learning at this conference. And just in the last week, God bless our neighbor to the north, Canada, they had not updated their food guidelines for the citizens in 12 years. Uh, we do it every five years in this country. It's a big political fight. But the last time we did it, one of the three eating plans the government said to follow was vegetarian vegan. Canada said, oh my God, we're gonna have no place to live in Canada that's clean. Let's eat half our plate fruit and vegetables. It's everything we've been doing for eight years now. Quarter of our plate, whole grains. Quarter of our plate, they specifically said we need to massively cut back animal product ingestion. We need to increase peas, beans, legumes, nuts, and seeds. And God knows, they said specifically, get rid of dairy. We should be drinking water and plant substitutes. This is in headlines all over the world. If you were the dairy industry, would you take this sitting down? No, of course they're pushing back. The meat industry is pushing back the cheese industry, but it's out there. It's this beautiful document. If you were to Google Canadian food guideline, I wrote a blog article today on the airplane down because it was delayed called the eight pillars of the plant diet that add these last two to six others I identified that are out there. Uh, if you're a eight pillars of plant diet, I think it's a pretty good overview, but this is just beautiful stuff. So, you know, we get attacked in the plant movement and you have brothers and sisters and brother-in-laws and co-workers and parents and children. Why are you doing all that? And you know, you don't want to be offensive, but look at Canada and eat Lancet and the USDA guidelines and the dietetics association and the government endorsing the Pritikin and Ornish program and on and on. Uh, there, aren't, there isn't anything that the other side has to say other than, some sexy people in bikinis that uh, look good, and just our traditional lust for this stuff. So common sense says, you know, discipline yourself, do the right thing, and you'll gain health. Some fun hair. The whiter the bread, the sooner you're dead. That's why it's whole grains, baby. Eat at least one salad every day as big as your head. God knows that's important. Don't buy your gas and your food at the same building. It's from a plant, eat it. Made in a plant, skip it. And eat food. Not too much, that's kind of the fasting world, and eat mostly, or in my case, only plants. 
Uh, I do own a bunch of restaurants because I'm insane. I hope I can say that in a year because it's not a, anything you ever brag about because uh, just difficult business. But if you're ever in Detroit, we got plants, we got bars, we call it plants and whiskey, kind of a fun combination. If you don't enjoy whiskey, no offense, I'm drinking sparkling soda. Uh, it's my choice. And some of you have heard uh, Dr. Michael Greger of nutritionfacts.org with the analogy, and I'll leave with this. If you knocked your shin into your coffee table and it got all swollen and sore and hurt like heck and you fell over in tears, but later in the day you went and you knocked the same spot again and it hurt like heck, and later in the day, third time you knocked your shin again, and you did it day after day after day after day, the darn thing's never going to heal, it's going to hurt, and you're going to be miserable. That's what we do with food. That's what we do with our plate. That's what we do at hospital food. That's what we do at school food. That's what we do at work food. That's what we do at vending machine and gas food and fast chain food. We are not careful about avoiding an insult over and over and over. And it is an insult. You know, we're putting it into our tube, which starts in our mouth and ends in our butt, and that tube lets us get that stuff in. Be careful what you put in that tube. Be wise what you put in that tube. You have all the support you need in the world that the scientists agree. Put food in your tube, and maybe five days a month, once in a while, put a little less specialized food in your tube, and you will benefit and you will blossom and you have the best chance of enjoying that great health span we talked about, lifespan, and you know, avoiding the medical system, which is tragically overtaxed and overburdened. So I thank you very much. We got a few minutes for questions. Right in the back, I saw you dancing. You must be Canadian. Please wait for the mic. Oh, Mike, 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 Mike. Is somebody named Mike here? Okay. <laughs> it's Mike. Hi, um, my name's Susan Wilson. I am from Canada, just outside of Toronto. And it's not really a question, but uh, I did want to just say uh, what Joel was saying last week. Canada changed its food guide. Um, I'm a nutritionist, also a raw food restaurant owner, which is very hard business. Over the last 10 years, people saying to me, but the Canada Food Guide says, eat this, eat this, eat this. They can't be wrong. Well, now, as you were saying, the Canada um, Food Guide has changed, but also, I don't know if you know, as of Thursday and Friday, the uh, Alberta uh, cattle farmers and uh, different areas are trying to sue the government yeah. Uh, in a matter of three days of releasing, limit your meat, limit your dairy. Um, so now they were on a big fight, but they're standing behind it. And it's just proven that finally they're waking up. So thank you for telling everybody thank that. Thank you. Thank you. And, you know, it's billions of dollars and they're going to try and sue. But the medical science is way too strong. Uh, the mic, I don't want to. Yeah, there's two hands here and then we'll go to the other side of the room. We do have, remember, dinner and vegan ice cream. And after I talk to you, I hope none of you eat the ice cream. Uh, I'll well, be watching. When you go under 900 calories, your metabolism slows down? So, when, you I mean, go, when you under, go on that diet? Under 900 calories. What's, I, mean, <clears throat> I, know, I know you heal. It's but. not actually measured you know, in the science. I'm trying to think if there's other science out there. I mean, there's a fascinating study two years ago that when you, you know, this, the rage right now is ketogenic diet, right. drop your carbs, right. eat high fat diets, usually of animal products. And actually the data out of the National Institutes of Health was, the rumor was that speeds up your metabolism to lose weight and be healthier. The studies of the National Institutes of Health showed it actually slows your metabolism after a couple of weeks. So that's the, I won't say the enemy, but it's certainly the diet I wouldn't endorse for health, a long-term plant, animal-based ketogenic diet. I don't think anybody, it's only five days. You do go into a little ketosis, then you go back to food, but it's remarkable what happens if you just give your body a little break to turn on these pathways. No, I've, I've done it. Yeah. I, I, I know about it. But yeah. um, how about just, you know, I, I read something, if you just drink black coffee and you exercise. What was the, the first part of your If drink? you drink black coffee and exercise in the morning, you lose 30% more fat because you're still fasting it's possible, from the night. It's possible, although the majority of the data is don't skip breakfast, which I struggle with because I don't like to eat breakfast. I like to wait to lunch. The majority of the data is strongly in favor of that. So I don't want to go on stage and tell you skip breakfast routinely, but you're right about what you're saying. I think the gentleman behind you, in the row behind you, had his hand up early. 
Yeah, th this was an excellent lecture. Thank uh, you. And as far as NATO goes, are you familiar with that as far as clearing the arteries? Is yeah. That... Okay, just uh, I just was interviewed before this by a future movie. I was talking about NATO. If you take soybeans and you want to, and you're in Japan, you can make a food called NATO. It's a paste. Actually, the broth, they release an enzyme in the process called natokinase, which has all kinds of magical healing arterial properties as a blood thinner. But natto is a paste that's very rich in vitamin K2. It's probably the best source of vitamin K2 if you want to get it from food. And there may be a role for using vitamin K2 to prevent and reverse arterial calcification. I do that in my practice. But it also comes in supplement form because there's one downside to eating natto. It smells like you're eating your underwear. It's really offensive. And if you stick with it, you'll get used to eating your underwear. But most of my patients won't do that. And it's not the clean version of the underwear either. It really has a pungent odor. And somehow, if you're Japanese, you're used to that, just like they'd look at us eating french fries and say, you're insane. It's a cultural thing, but they have very low heart rates, probably in part by natto. We need a microphone, or the, unless you want to just go to the one in front, and then we'll go over there. I think they're, they're doing it by microphone. Are there studies that follow uh, grass-fed uh, cattle as, as an alternative to the uh, grain-fed? Yeah, Ooh. maybe you, you may take the mic and walk over. Grass-fed versus grain-fed. Some things can't possibly change because the structure mm -hmm. of meat in an animal is going to be the same. It's muscle and the amino acids and such. So I won't go into it right now, but there's, there's a really interesting body of science. Some of you may have heard. Dr. Clapper probably will talk about it. TMAO, a molecule in the body. It doesn't matter if you grass-fed or grain-fed. It's going to drive this molecule up in the blood, and it's not good for hearts. TMAO, it's something you can measure in the blood. There may be a bit more omega-3 in grass-fed beef, but if you want to get your omega-3 from, from beef, it's like, why bother filtering it? It's like getting your B12 from beef. There's so many better places to get it. I mean, there may be a bit less exposure to pesticides and uh, antibiotics if you're getting a good farm that's organic. At the end of the day, though, when careful analysis, Oxford University analyzed all different kinds of agricultural methods to support 10 billion people by 2050, they said the only way to do it is plant nutrition. We can't do grass-fed, free-range. There simply isn't the land to do it. So if you personally say, I want meat and I can find organic grass-fed beef, you're probably making a better decision. I would say, eat your beans. It's not sustainable. Oh, yeah. I have, oh. I have Go. Hi. Um, can you give me your opinion on uh, biohacking, the bulletproof diet? Yeah. They tell you you should have MCT Boosa. oil or Sorry. coconut oil. Oh. Sorry. Something came over me. And it's all, the, yeah. it's all the rage, but I've seen some very prominent doctors that you would probably know who I won't name. Bullshit. Speak about. Okay, gotcha. Sorry, Steve. Can you do a favor? I'll answer it if you give the lady in the beret your mic, because she's been patiently waiting. But I will answer. So five years ago, bulletproof coffee. Five years ago, I walked into a conference room of 30 people, and this really bizarre big guy Pink Glasses was there, and we became friends. His name's Dave Asprey, and he was launching a company out of Vancouver and Seattle called Bulletproof Coffee. Because the story goes, he was searching for Zen in Tibet at 14,000 feet and saw the monks drink tea with yak butter, and it gave them energy, and it energized them, and he decided the idea is take coffee in the United States and Canada and put two tablespoons of butter in it and put coconut oil in it and blend it up and make an 800 calorie cup of coffee instead of a zero calorie cup of coffee and add so much saturated fat that you'll never have an erection again. And he's such a good marketer, and I mean that. It's now a $100 million company. And people are so stupid, they go in Whole Food where it's in cans, and they go in Starbucks where it's in containers, and you can go to the gym and do this, and you're basically feeding your body the highest possible alteration of a generally a good drink, coffee. His coffee's good, it's crazy expensive, it's checked for fungal toxins, mold, mycotoxin. You want to spend $24 a pound on coffee, bulletproof coffee in a bag is not bad. But the idea is get the blender, get the butter, get the coconut oil, blend it all up every day, every day, every day. And when he pitched it to me early on, I didn't buy it then. I realized it was evil from the beginning. It just is evil. 
the idea was you had bulletproof coffee, you went kind of fasting till 5, 6 p.m., and then you ate one dinner, and it helped you with weight and longevity and youthfulness. I go to medical meetings where they serve this stuff, and there is a zillion distorted doctors drinking bulletproof coffee. And it's with the eggs and bacon and bulletproof coffee, and then they have the lunch. You just added 800, 700, 600 calories to your diet. There's not a single study for health. The problem is there's not a single study that shows how harmful it is. We just need one and it can bring his company down. And it really isn't hard to do. It's just, who's gonna fund it? It's not even all that expensive. Uh, don't do it, you know? Um, and whether MCT oil, which is a very purified form of coconut oil, has a brain benefit or not. Coconut oil, I wouldn't do. Whether MCT oil, not for the heart patient. I wouldn't do it. I see no reason to use MCT oil, but it, it is super purified coconut oil. Very yes. patient lady. Thank you. I'd like to ask you, doctor, about coenzyme 10 and, and resveratrol. Okay. As we age, supposedly our coenzyme 10 is depleted. And yeah. so what is the correlation? Is that helpful to the heart? Yeah. So coenzyme Q10, CoQ10, ubiquinone, ubiquinol. There'll be different opinions by different experts. You, you're talking to one of the biggest fans in the world. You're right. It's a antioxidant. It's involved in making energy from According to the grass, age 40 on, we don't make as much. And if we're taking a statin, Lipitor, Zocor, we really knock out our production. The reason I'm such a fan, other than it's been known, the biochemistry of how it works for 50, 60 years, is that there's a study in Sweden. You're over age 70, you're healthy. Your doctor slips you a CoQ10 selenium pill. Selenium's a mineral or a placebo, it's an actual scientific study. They've now followed these hundreds of people 14 years later, you live longer if you take CoQ10 and selenium. I don't know why this really dramatic scientific study has not translated into more positive comments about CoQ10, because there's very few vitamins we can actually say, what, what's wrong with this? It's a randomized placebo controlled trial, and the endpoint was survival and survival was better, so I'm a big fan. Resveratrol, I'm waiting, you know, resveratrol is a polyphenol you can get in peanuts and grapes and wine, red wine, and whether it actually prolong your life, it might. It might do what fasting does in a pill, but we've said might for 20 years, we don't know. I, I don't start it on my patients, but I don't stop it if they wanna take it. Maybe one more question, and I don't know where the microphone is because it's going to be dinner time. You have the mic? Oh, sorry, go. Thank you for a really great lecture. Thank you. Um, my question is, why do you like chlorella, uh, chlorella so much, and how is it different from spirulina? Um, well, they're both algaes. There's a lot of omega. It's a source of omega-3. Um, it's a source of minerals. Purportedly, chlorella has a very detoxifying benefit. They do, you, I mean, honestly, if it's at Hippocrates, you've got pretty good confidence. It's been thought about that heavy metals, mercury, lead, arsenic, cadmium, Chlorella can help remove, and there is data to that. Um, spirulina, people talk more about it, boosts energy. Whether if you eat enough chlorophyll-rich greens, there's actually one paper that says you might actually create energy from the sunlight, like you've become a plant if you eat enough, and you actually may feel more energized. It's actually a true scientific theory and scientific study. Um, and I don't know much downside. I mean, a good source of chlorella there is a little data about it being radiation protective, so you're gonna have a CT scan, a handful of chlorella. There's just no downside to it. There's published data that helps lower cholesterol, blood sugar, blood pressure. It's kind of a natural green, ultra green. And it's usually a powder for spirulina and little tablets for chlorella. So I have a lot of patients with mercury in their blood. I hate it. I mean, they're eating fish at high Tony restaurants and they're getting poisoned. And I dump a lot of chlorella in them. So I think, Steve, I better stop because it's dinner and evil ice cream time. I will be here signing a book called Don't Eat Bacon. Now, that's the next book, all right. Don't have bulletproof coffee. You want one last question? You're in charge. I'm not in charge. Okay. Uh, okay, thanks. Um, question. question is, uh, as far as I uh, know, Dr. Furman is still recommending keeping the added sodium in your diet under 400 milligrams a day. Well, I wonder if you agree with that or what's your recommendation on salt and sodium? Yes, uh, you know, salt is an interesting topic because just like you'll find medical doctors recommending butter in their coffee, you will find medical doctors telling you to jack up the salt. They might talk about Celtic salt and Himalayan salt and pink salt, but salt is good. There's a PhD with a book called The Salt Fix. You know, our biggest medical problem is lack of salt in our diet. 
you know, it's hard to sort out. I'm still pretty normative on salt, 1,500 milligrams. It's kind of the national goal. Um, if you really lower it, if you're struggling with blood pressure and you want to get off meds and you want a natural approach in addition to a plant diet and adding in uh, hibiscus tea and ground flax seed and uh, exercise and weight control, I mean, ultra low right. salt diet, it's just hard. Restaurants don't honor it and processed food doesn't honor it. So if you're in a situation where you can create beautiful foods that you, you know, make your own, um, it's perfect. It's going to take discipline and all. Um, yeah, your blood pressure will come down if you can hit that level. Steve Shore, what's next? Stand-up comedy hour, open mic, or we go to dinner? Oh, my God. It's so nice of you. I you got to double my honorarium. There's so many questions. Who had the mic? I don't know where to go. Up. You, you can shout it out. Go. I think we're going to have to ask Brian Clements that at the panel, maybe tomorrow night. You know, there, there's there been some data that high calcium uh, bone preparations and such might lead to calcium in the blood and calcium in bones. But there have been other studies that say, you know, if your doc has you on a bone support with some calcium, it's not a big issue. I, I really don't think it's resolved. And I haven't heard it from a plant-based milk issue. Um, I'm not sure how many milligrams are in your... Oat milk or hemp milk, I don't know. Bio, 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 bio organic. Always a good idea. Last question, sir. What is your uh, take on a uh, GAPS diet as proposed by Dr. Natasha Campbell McBride? Yeah, GAPS, G-A-P-S is kind of a gut healing diet. It's not a plant only diet. I, honestly, I know it's out there. I don't have a comment for you. I probably should, um, you know, it. Dr. Joe Mercola talks about it, and that's when I turn my brain off. Uh, very honestly, I used to, I used to respect him, but I, I don't find him a great resource. Not everybody's a nutrition expert. I mean, the head of cardiology at the Cleveland Clinic, Stephen Nissen, says, I'm not a nutrition expert. Then he goes ahead and gives all kinds of crazy advice to the world on nutrition, because he's got a big title. Um, Dr. David Katz, if you know the name from Yale, makes that point. He writes textbooks on nutrition. I don't know if I'm a nutrition expert. I spend five hours a day reading this stuff, but I don't have a PhD or a, a master's of public health. I kind of wish I did because the science and the studies and what's omitted, what's included, very challenging. That's why it's beautiful when these Eat Lancet and Canadian guidelines and Dietetics Association, maybe they've all been bought off by broccoli and artichoke producers, but they'd be much smarter to take the money from the meat, dairy, and eggs. They got much more money. so. I think it's authentic messages you can trust. Okay, last one, Steve will kill me. I really gotta stop, yes. B12 is a question. Does it raise the heart level? So the question is, the B12, you know, B12 we think of anemia if you don't have it, neuropathy, brain disease, um, specifically, um, you know, it can raise something. If you're B12 deficient, something called homocysteine, an amino acid, can go up, and that's not very good for your arteries. So year after year after year, B12 deficient, high homocysteine is not ideal, but that's the only really direct cardiac connection. That's indirect, I can think of. So don't be B12 deficient. Be healthy, not B12 deficient. Okay, Steve, it's time. Thank you very much.